So we move to the next speaker. And uh, please, Owen, where are you? So the next speaker is Owen White. He comes from Tiger, the Institute for Genomic Research in Rockford, USA. You don't want to come, yeah. Owen? <laughs> And he's director of bioinformatics at Tiger, and he's responsible for the development of Tiger annotation methodology. You could say that most of those b numerous genomes that Tiger produce have gone through the tools that Owen White either wrote himself or supervised the writing of it. I mean, he joined Tiger in '92, first as a, and now he's project leader of the Comprehensive Microbial Resource Project. As BioLink for you, I've put Amherst, Las Cruces, and Rockville. And Bowlings, I mean, he has, of course, worked a lot with Claire Fraser at Tiger, with uh, Steven Salzberg when he was uh, doing Hamer, and Jonathan Eisen, and, of course, Craig Venter. Yes. Now, two other things about, <laughs> I mean, Owen. Owen has a very, very good sense of humor. And so, you know, in computer science, there are always Easter egg in software. In biological, uh, I mean, in molecular biology, there's also Easter eggs. If you look at publication closely in some places and so on, so on things. And there have been things since the early genome of Tiger, uh, which were hidden in different places. Like, for example, if you align the list of Metanococcus yanashi authors <laughs> in the submission compared to the published paper in Science, you see that there is an author which is missing, Mr. Presley E.A. And, in fact, Elvis was at that time working at Tiger, and this was, of course, hidden in submission. And there's a lot of other things that probably, after beer, Owen will tell you is that if you have the original science and nature article from the genome, and you look closely at the genome maps, you will see interesting things in them. Second thing is, uh, I mean, Owen has already been in Brazil, and his favorite place in Brazil is the Macarena Stadium, where he asks that every a nasty word which was said by some uh, member of the public be translated to him directly so that he could follow the football match much more effectively. So, and thank you for being here. And I will... Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, this is a picture of my colleague Sam. We've already had some fun. We went to the sand dunes and uh, did a little uh, skiing. And um, I just uh, want to thank the organizers very much. I really, I love Brazil, and I always feel so happy when I'm here. And uh, so I, I very much appreciate being able to come here. And I will talk about these two systems here. Um, uh, hopefully, I will be relatively brief uh, on, uh, and, and be able to, to present for both of them. Um, if there are more questions that you have and you're attending the ISMB meetings, um, by all means, please go to poster H8082 and, and B46, where there are people who could um, discuss many more of the details of, of what I'm presenting. So I will um, give uh, primarily my talk on our comparative analysis system that we refer to as CIVIL. And um, symbol, CIVIL is a system that is principally composed of uh, just a, a, a small number of methods. We have um, all versus all blast searches, like everyone else, and we also use Mummer, which is a very nice nucleotide alignment program that performs alignments on both the nucleotide and, and protein level. And um, then we have several different clustering methods that I'll, I'll talk about in greater detail. Um, what's important about these clustering methods is there's many configuration scripts that are part of the process that can be set by the user and you can explore your data at, at many different levels and, and, and decide what works best for you. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about our um, method of collecting uh, centenic blocks, which is a, a very s a simple way of, of uh, improving um, what you're looking at in the data. So um, 
Sam, his poster will give a much greater detail in our in our workflow system, but um, uh, I could reserve my entire talk for our system that's referred to as Ergodis. And Ergodis is, is basically a method of allowing you to describe an entire pipeline, both parallel and um, serial computes that need to be performed in order to accomplish different tasks in an informatics environment. And what we've done is we've implemented everything that I'm about to show um, to you in the, in, in the Ergata system. And I, I won't go into too much detail with this slide here. I just mentioned to you that we're performing BLAST and Mummer. But what's interesting um, about the Ergata system is all of it's encoded um, in BSML, which is a, a one form of XML that uh, displays uh, bi uh, molecular biology information as, as, as well as searching results. And all of this can exist as flat files on your system, and then eventually it gets loaded into a database. What database did we choose to use? Um, we've been, uh, after much evaluation, we found a relational database that we're very happy with. There's a consortium of, of developers out there um, for the generic model organism database, and they've developed a database called Chado. And the general overall system for Sybil, the, the system that I'm about to show you, uh, we have several different types of loaders that can be loading lots of different types of data into the Chado database. And then our um, Ergodis system is uh, extracting the information from the database running this overall uh, pipeline and loading the data back into the database. Um, before I show you some of the results, I just want to go very quickly over some of the um, clustering methods that we've been using. Um, anybody who searched uh, lots of proteins against each other realize that you are faced with the problem of deciding what is the metrics that you're going to use for bringing together proteins into a, a system. So we've used a method that was uh, pub originally published by Jacquard, and um, one of the main points that I want to make here is that the proteins, as they're described here, are just to find the paralogs within a genome. And if I, I'm having a little trouble with a keyboard, sorry. If, if I talk about um, a scoring me measure that's existing as basically an edge between two proteins, that scoring measure is based on two pieces of information. It is based on the number of edges that, I think I need a laser pointer, I just, I can't manage with this pointer here. Oh, the mouse, okay. No, I use the mouse, okay. Um, if you confine your thinking to what is the score for this edge between P1 and P2, what we do is we just ask the question, how many bi-directional best hits are there between P, P1 and P2? And the answer is three. And then if we look at the total number of, of matches, this is basically um, best hits that can, are, are not necessarily pairwise, but are going across all these proteins. The number of matches or the number of edges that we have here are five concerning this edge right here. And so just by this division process, we end up with a score for this position here of 0.6. And all I'm doing here is I'm just trying to rationally bring together proteins in a way that pairwise best matches don't quite do it, but you have to make a decision about where some of the matches are, are essentially going to get cut off. And by um, em empirical analysis, what we've discovered basically is that um, if you set your, your cutoff point of being 0.6, many times you get very useful pro uh, protein clusters. And so this one would ultimately get a, a um, group together as all having scores above um, 0.6, and these would be uh, separated into separate clusters. After we do that jacquard filtering, we perform another trick, and this is because we're doing a comparative analysis between genomes. We look at these different jacquard clusters that I'm labeling JAK1 and JAK2, and basically ask the same question, what are the pairwise best matches that are existing between these different JAKs? And we collect these together, and this is what we refer to as the jacquard filtered orthologs, and I'll show you displays for this information. And all we're doing here is just trying to use some type of rational method combined with a little bit of empiricism to make some decisions about what we would call potential orthologs that exist between genomes. It's not perfect, but it seems to be working pretty well. Another method that we've been using is a well-known um, algorithm called minimum spanning tree method. 
which is a way of sort of deep convoluting the total number of edges in a graph to the minimum set of edges. And this picture here shows you what, if you're looking at um, matches between proteins, some of the relationships that you end up with. After filtering with a minimum spanning tree algorithm, um, it gets reduced down to the smallest number of edges that describe that overall graph. And that's also been another way of, of simplifying some of the presentations. So now I'm just going to show you a bunch of screenshots. Sybil is data that's loaded into a Chato database, and then we have different ways of extracting that information out, typically displaying um, information on a web page, and um, those web pages are shown to you here. In our demo database that's available online, we've got three comparisons between three different species, and if you can imagine another species that's sort of off the page right now, and each one of the chromosomes are colored one solid color, and then ask the question, where do I have symptony between that whole chromosome and portions of T. brucei or L. major? That's what these colors correspond to here. That's just one display that we've um, dealt with. We wrestle a lot with just trying to give as much information to the user without overwhelming them too much. This is another web page that's essentially doing the same thing. Plasmodium falciparum is being compared to Christosporidium parvum, and Plasmodium yellowii is down here. Now, these are each one of the chromosomes associated with the input data. In some cases, those chromosomes are representative of scaffolds, so you see tick marks here representing that these two contigs are next to each other. For Plasmodium uellii, it was all a bunch of contigs. They were not located onto chromosomes, and so all the data was basically displayed as one single chromosome. And now, if the user were to click on one of these chromosomes, you go to a page like this, and now I've sort of inverted this display. This is the display on a horizontal level going here, and um, just to uh, help you navigate with the system a little bit more easily, now everything's been placed in a vertical level, and we're looking at this individual chromosome right here for Plasmodium falciparum, and all of the matches that are found for this individual chromosome as they behave to Cryptosporidium are displayed in this sort of same format of chromosome one has the same color, those matches if they're Jacquard plus filtered cogs, and they appear in Plasmodium falciparum are displayed here. Um, users can click into this information either, even further and look at some of our displays between orthologs that are f displayed between these different genomes. There's a lot of extra information. I won't go into too much detail, but you, of course, can see the gene names and this number of exons, how many amino acids, its physical location on the chromosome. And we've used, uh, tried several different strategies. If um, we have one web page where you could just simply perform a mouse over, over an individual gene for uh, associated with a Jacquard cluster, and this additional information pops up. Of course, we've discovered as we started doing comparative analysis between these different genome projects that there's lots of different problems associated with just the input annotation of these different genomes. And so uh, a, a big part of our business is trying to develop web displays that if you were to click on this gene or to click on these cogs to be able to improve the gene structure associated with these two, these different um, genes. And so it's, it's all a matter of just doing the best job you can for displaying as much information without overwhelming the user. Uh, this is another case that's uh, a representative of one of our um, algorithms for finding syntenic blocks. Right now you're looking at chromosome uh, 11 for plasmodium falciparum along here at the top. And if I've got Jacquard filtered cogs between that and uh, my uh, C. parvum, I'm going to display uh, uh, different matches between them based on what chromosome it's coming from for C. parvum. So this is a match from one chromosome. This is a match from another chromosome. That's the Jacquard filtering cogs. But what I mentioned that we have another algorithm for finding syntenic blocks, and that's represented in this display here, where the only syntenic blocks that is a, a, a set of genes such as five genes with no intervening genes between them are um, found here and found here. So there's times when you uh, really are only going to see um, information popping up at you for gen uh, sections that seem particularly uh, relevant biologically when you do um, smoothing techniques like this. Um, this is uh, just yet another picture. Everything that I displayed to you so far was associated with web pages. But the same Sybil system generates um, vector-based graphics. So in this case, we're using SVG. And all that, what's nice about SVG is that um, can be uh, sent to other drawing algorithms and used for um, publications. And um, this is a figure from an example publication. And this figure was four megabases 
uh, four megabytes in size. It showed all the chromosomes, um, and it's those type of overwhelming centerfolds that uh, I'm known for putting uh, Easter eggs in. That's all been automatically generated from the from the Sybil system. So um, this is also nice because it indicates some of the other stuff that we're trying to bring uh, information that we're trying to bring to the user, including information like GC skew, the percent GC, and that type of thing. But that picture, you can kind of imagine filling much more than this entire wall space of several different chromosomes. It's ready for just uh, putting directly into a publication. It's very nice that way. Now, I'd also like to mention a uh, project that you should be aware of, which is the, the pan-genome um, concept that was put together by Hervé Tetelin at Tiger. And uh, the pan-genome is kind of a whimsical concept, which is if you've got a, a number of closely related different species, a number of closely related strains, ultimately you should be able to identify all the genes that are within that clade of strains. You would imagine that eventually you could kind of converge on the total number of genes or get an idea of the total number of genomes that you have to sequence to find all the genes that might be biologically relevant. And one of the things that Hervé showed was a picture like this, which was even as you continue to get sequence more genomes, if you just ask how many genes do I find in common to all these genomes, you get a display like this. So if I just sequence two genomes and compare those genomes in pairwise matches against each other, each time I get a total count of number of genes that are shared between them, I'll put a dot there. Okay, and that's what this is. All these, these are pairwise um, comparisons of all the different genomes that he had available to him at the time, and he asked, how many genes do I have in common? And the idea is, we'd like to imagine that as he sequenced more and more genomes, eventually you've got a core set of genes that you can identify for these guys, and that core set of genes um, is sort of representative of everything that might be in that clade. And the question is, can you develop some type of algorithm, uh, sort of line-fitting algorithm, to, to take a guess at how many genomes you have to complete in order to identify all the genes? Or another way to say this is, I'm identifying new genes. Ultimately, you just give up and you say, okay, each time I sequence a new genome, I, end, I keep on ending up seeing new genes appear into the mix. I don't know why biology is doing this, but if I look at all these strep genomes, it seems to be doing this. And I'd like to have a line-fitting algorithm, at least, that could tell me what are the, to the number of new genes that I could expect to see um, across these genomes. Well, this was a great opportunity once Hervé had kind of worked out some of this line-fitting work with his, uh, his colleagues that, uh, that published the paper with him. We thought maybe we could reuse that formula for uh, applying that analysis to a bunch of other genomes. So what I'm going to show you here is um, raw data that's coming from a comparison of many different chlamydia species when um, we perform the same trick of saying, okay, for the total number of genomes, let's make comparisons between them and make an estimate of the total number of new genes that we seem to be finding. And so it was great for Hervé that when he did this analysis for strep, it seemed to be sort of behaving in kind of a nice way that you get a band of genes that seem to be appearing as a, a new number of genes when you for each genome that you do. But that doesn't seem to be really happening with chlamydia. It seems, again, kind of like there's sort of groups. So these might be branches of the phylogenetic tree for these, for these strains where we might be able to say there's some type of convergence of new genes. And I could, another way I could think of it is I could aver average across all these groups and say, sure, okay, eventually I'm kind of converging down. But it seems like we've got a lot of new and interesting discovery to do there. And, uh, Sybil's a tool that's allowing people to do this in kind of a nice point-and-click environment. Um, the last thing I want to mention about Sybil is that it's open source. It's available on SourceForge. There's, on SourceForge, there's a very expensive, extensive amount of documentation and a complete demo database, and it's got a lot of other packages rolled into it. We are uh, good citizens in terms of participating with the open source uh, development that's going on. Um, if you want to use Sybil, there's something that's very important that you have to know. You have to be able to load data into Chato, and you've got to eventually be able to run our, our Goddess system. We have different types of flat file converters that create BSML and allow you to load that data into Chato, and this is going to be released soon as open source. And uh, last night, Sam and I traveled thousands of miles to come here, and I was sitting in my hotel room, and he was sitting in his hotel room, and we engaged in a chat discussion, and I wrote him, hey, when are we going to release Ergodis? 
And he said, well, these scripts will be available really soon. And he says, we need a deadline. And I said, okay, is this on record? I'll just put this in the chat in my PowerPoint for tomorrow. And, and then we kind of committed Sam into, he's got to, he's got to make Sybil available. He's got to make her goddess available in the very near future. And so you can go visit his poster and talk to him about that. Okay. So I've got five minutes left. I'm going to talk a little bit about an epidemiological database uh, development that we're doing here, um, which is essentially another, uh, uh, Amos introduced the idea of doing ontologies or controlled vocabulary terms. I completely agree with his observation that the reason you call them ontologies and the reason you call them controlled vocabularies has a lot more to do with whether or not you're going for funding. And I would say that we are going for funding, but we're making controlled vocabularies more than we are making an ontology. Um, but we've started to develop an epidemiological database for ontologies. And primarily, the concept that we're trying to put together is this rather elaborate one. And when I talk to my friends in control vocabulary uh, development, it seems like other people are having this experience. If I want to define something rather complicated, like an infection system, that a pathogen infects a host, it's actually kind of a dot product or a product of collecting several different control vocabularies together. And I'll try to describe you what I mean. I'd like to be able to describe that anthrax infects humans. Okay, well that means I've got to be categorizing a pathogen. I need to be categorizing a host and a transmission method. And there's different parts of the anatomy that that pathogen will infect and it causes different diseases. And in point of fact, we're also having to work with development of controlled vocabulary terms of things like symptoms or the reservoir, that is the organism that that host may reside in or that pathogen may reside in, as well as geographic location. Let me expand this a little bit further. For Clostridium botulinum, if I'm going to describe a concept like infection system, I want to put together pathogen, host, transmission method, and anatomy. And here's a couple examples. Clostridium botulinum C is known to infect cow, and the transmission method is an indirect vehicle-borne ingestation. You may also see the same type of transmission method when botulinum F infects Homo sapiens. It infects the gastrointestinal tract, and the type of disease that it would cause is perhaps infant botulism or foodborne botulism. And these descriptions are the types of things that we have to work out in order to be able to be describing disease for a different uh, uh, for different purposes, and I'll just talk a little bit more about these individual control vocabularies a little bit further. There right now are many many control vocabularies for disease. I think Susanna Lewis is here, and she could probably go into this in greater detail. But we certainly have discovered that there's many different sources of of, of control vocabularies for disease, and we've started to work with a a, a couple. Um, uh, uh, sets of terms that are out there, and really what we're doing more than anything is sort of pulling them apart and removing things like, um, in the terms that we've been using, um, they also have not only diseases, but they also have symptoms. And so we've been pulling that information out and developing our own control vocabulary, and the total number of uh, control vocabulary terms that we have for disease is listed here, the number of terms we have for anatomy. And these control vocabularies, the other thing that we've been doing is constructing them into hierarchical lists so you can get different um, bits of information as in sort of underlying uh, child terms that are associated with aspects of the, of the parent terms. And that's also been the subject of a fair amount of work. And I'm not really showing this to show you uh, individual data that suggests we're doing a really terrific job. What I'm really trying to do is advertise the fact that we are starting to get into this business and we'd really start like to be working in partnership with lots of other people. We fully recognize that if we're developing controlled vocabulary terms, there's no hope of it being adopted unless we start developing some greater degree of community buy-in. And so this is an open invitation to really start working with some people. We have an anatomy ontology, and for example, the, one of the parent terms might be something like respiratory system, and then there's deeper uh, child terms that are associated with this anatomy, and ultimately it allows you to, if you've got information about where an infection occurs specifically in the lung, like the aviola or the respiratory tract, you could eventually ask questions about, give me all the pathogens that are associated with infection into the respiratory system. That's what this enables you to do. 
Believe it or not, there's also a hierarchical control vocabulary that describes geographical location. This is a, a set of data that is already available um, and it's out there on the web. And I asked my curator who's doing work on the control vocabularies to pull together exactly what are the parent-child terms that gets us all the way to here. Um, we have a web page, which is very rudimentary now. It's out on the web really for demonstration purposes. We'd love to have people come and use it. I won't go into it in, in a lot of detail. It's the same story as many control vocabularies at, that are hierarchically based, where you can click on terms and expand on them and, and take a look at all the, the children. And I'm just not going to go in that into too much detail here. Um, in terms of the total number of infection systems, that is that product that exists across um, organism name and disease and anatomy, the number of infection systems that we've curated so far is uh, 1,600. It involves lots of different pathogens. We've been focusing on a category of or a, a description of pathogens that is based on something put together by the NIH, which are the category A through C organisms. We've covered almost all the category A through C organisms. We expect to be completed there in, in, in very short order. Um, I, the one thing that's very important to understand is that most of the data that we're getting um, is has been relationalized and it's been described in a relational system that we're working with in partnership with some people that are at IBIS Therapeutics. In particular, um, uh, there's uh, two guys over there that have published um, what they're referring to as the microbial Rosetta Stone database. And the background on this is it's a terrific database. There's an incredible amount of information in it, but they don't want to be getting into the business of actually making a public repository. And they're interested in partnering with Tiger as being the, the outside kind of open uh, access database associated with a lot of this information. And we'd like to be starting to get data from the, from the user community and rolling it into this, and it'll be available to the, com to the community um, using open source uh, licensing strategies. And uh, we're just in the middle of, of working that out. And importantly, we've re we, both of our shops have received funding, so that's going to ensure that we've really got to make this data public. But uh, these guys were the ones that really did a work on the original database. So what are the kinds of applications for this? Uh, the types of things that you would be able to do is um, be monitoring lots of things in animal health care or food safety. If there's clinics out there that are identifying that there's, that there's organisms that are uh, infecting people, that type of thing, these are straightforward applications for the database. But what our goal is is that it's going to be entirely open access. So um, I would really like to be the uh, Google equivalent of the CDC, if that makes sense to many people. There's uh, some data disease tracking agencies at the, in the United States that are doing a very poor job of sharing their data, and we'd like to make an alternative system that, that, that's available to people for storing information um, having to do with epidemiology. All of it will be available um, as open access. And I've got a few more slides, but I think I'll just uh, skip past that. And I want to recognize, in particular, some of the geniuses who've been doing a lot of work. Sam Angioli is here. He was the guy that was uh, sliding down the sand. Um, he developed a civil ergotic system along with many other developers. There's a, a, a very talented interface developer named Jonathan Crabtree that uh, developed all the web pages that I showed you. And Aaron Gusman is having a little bit of travel problems, but he should still be able to make it for ISMB. And um, he's uh, one of the guys that's doing the development of the Gemini system. And I will end there. So do we have any questions for Owen? <laughs> well, I, I have a question because you you showed with Sybil that there might be when there are on um, syntonic pairs, yes. there, there that there could be difference in. You mentioned there could be difference in in the annotation. Yes. Have you yeah. tried to study how well you within the tiger annotation? How well, well you uh, you annotate the different organisms? Well, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it's an exhaustive study, but frequently for the eukaryotic genome projects where we are doing annotation, they're multi-institutional. There are many places that are contributing, and they've all got different pipelines, and you're always going to find differences in your ability to to make uh, gene models, the exon intron structures that are associated with these genomes. And what we've done in in some isolated cases is to get together with these other institutions 
and we've been using Sybil as the interface to allow people to look at the overall annotation and improve them. But in eukaryotic annotation in particular, the problem of identifying the, the true gene structure of ectron introns is absolutely not solved. Everyone can tell you many examples of this. And so from our point of view, we just value that there's lots of comparative data that helps you also drive and improve the annotation. But I think your question was, have I done a, an exhaustive study of, of doing comparative analysis? And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, then I will thank Owen again.